David. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> David Wilcock is a professional intuitive consultant who, since reading Richard C. Hoagland's The Monument of Mars in 1993, has intensively researched ufology, ancient civilizations, consciousness, science, and new paradigms of matter and energy. He is the author of the critically acclaimed trilogy of scientific research works known as the Convergence Series, which gives a definitive support to the idea that a change in matter, energy, and consciousness is now occurring on the Earth and throughout the solar system. He has appeared on broadcast television, lectured throughout the United States and Japan, published a variety of magazine articles, and has appeared on numerous talk shows just like this one. I'd like to welcome back to the show our good friend David Wilcock. David, how are you tonight, sir? That sounds like some pretty interesting stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> all, fo all focused right at you. Uh, hey, uh, really quick, before we get things started, I I'm just going to go here between us. How's the guitar going? Excellent. I've been working on uh, a couple songs. I've been working on um, Misunderstanding by Genesis, which has a pretty interesting chord progression. Ooh. And I've been working on some Jim Croce stuff, including uh, I've Got a Name, which actually has a really interesting double hammer on and pull off in the beginning, done by his uh, right hand man, Maury Muleheisen. You know what? He was, he's one of the un unspoken guitar greats. You know, they think oh, about yeah. Jim Croce, but he was, Maury was unbelievable when you watch. Darn right. Oh, man. And. Uh, the thing is about Croce, and we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but you're hitting me right in my heart right now. <laughs> it's The songs are so good, and they're so singable, that's because they're well-written. But what you don't realize, what's going on underneath that, as far as guitar goes, is about as complicated as it gets. You are biting off a big one right there, man. It's, that's tough. It's modern, it's modern classical, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. You know, you know uh, I'd rather learn some Randy Rhodes. <laughs> Go Absolutely. <and> <laughs> it's, it's easier than Jim Croce stuff. Yeah, I went through a Jim Croce phase, and I, I almost, like, gave up. You know, I was like, man, this is just too much, man. It, and then when you go and watch some of the old Jim Croce videos, those guys are singing and playing at the same time and getting yeah. it done. That is, that's some rough stuff, man. Good for you. That's, that's what I'm doing, buddy. And I'm playing Maury's parts, not Jim's parts. Yeah, so. that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Impressed, man. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Thank you. All right. It is, it is very difficult, and I'll spend countless numbers of hours on one song, just working it out. Yeah, know? one song, one chorus, countless yeah. hours on one yeah, chorus. Yeah, exactly. So it's the season, man. Are you are you wound up? Are you uh, are you are you ready? You know, well, it's, it's it's Christmas. Los Angeles, so it doesn't really feel the same. There's no snow, you know. Do you uh, <laughs> I went into a couple stores and heard some Christmas songs, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, I, I remember when uh, uh, when I was doing all of that with my uh, daughters when they were really young, and I was hanging up in Southern in, in Sherman Oaks, hanging up stockings on the fireplace. <laughs> And I'm like, that just doesn't look right. <laughs> you know, I don't know if they get it, but right now, those stockings on the fireplace just don't look right. <laughs> One block from Ventura Boulevard, you know what I mean? I'm just really happy we had rain. I mean, that was our big Christmas gift here. Yes, it certainly was. Hey, I, I had a bucket outside, and, and I got like, you know, three or four inches, and then I dumped it, and then I got like six or seven inches and dumped it again. Then it got another inch. It's awesome. You know, I was just, um, we, we only have so much time together tonight, so I'm going to, as you know, this is an open-ended conversation, and uh, I haven't talked to you in a while, but it's also timed, we're at the end of a, a pretty crazy year, 2014. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm just going to throw this, uh, we're, we're, there's a lot of stuff to talk about, but going into 2015, uh, I just asked Micah Hanks this question. Now we're going into 2015. There, I, I really feel that 2014 was a pretty dramatic year on so many fronts. Every single week, something was going down, but we got through it. Somehow, we got That's through true. 2014. You're right, buddy. Uh, what What can we do, uh, and what are you going to do uh, going into 2015 to to change things and make 2015 a better year? Well, I think the first thing I'm going to do is mind wipe 2014 and just act like it never happened. <laughs> 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 just erase my brain. Defrag the drive. 
I, I'm with you. And we, I just said, I just said this uh, to Micah. It's it's really true. I think ten years from now, we're going to look back at 2014 as being a pretty crazy, significant year for us all. We have a lot of unanswered questions going into 2015. Well, you got to understand the full scope of what is truth and what is knowledge and what's happening to us to really grasp why things are so bizarre, why everybody is suffering. And in order to do that, we got to go down the rabbit hole really fast and really deep. But I know your listeners can handle that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So here's the deal. If you want to call them the Illuminati or the planetary cabal, they're not running this game. They're being manipulated by extraterrestrials. And those extraterrestrials need fear as a food supply. They call it louche. And so what they're doing is the closer that this cabal gets to being exposed and defeated, which is happening, and there's more and more signs of that, which we can talk about, there is more and more pushback from the spiritual realms. And these negative entities do have the ability to mess around and do things. So everything is reaching this point of crashing drama because these bad guys do not want to lose. And so they're fighting with everything they've got. They're trying constantly to create new wars and new problems for us. We have, we have so many examples of that uh, this year, not only in the domestic sense with what is going on with race and Ferguson and our, our police and, and that infrastructure. We have Frickin the, Ebola. A, I mean, a, right. We have Ebola. We have MH17, MH370, yeah. Crimea, Russia, uh, North Korea. All is of this is bombing the Palestinians. It's yeah, yes, this, yes, yes. It is, it, are these all examples of us uh, uh, not allowing it to get crazier? There are so many things that could have spiraled out of control that didn't spiral out of control. Uh, if you look at, as I'm sure your listeners know, the Georgia Guidestones. Yes. It's a, it's a Stonehenge-like monument of 14-foot-tall gigantic granite blocks in Georgia. And it has a series of uh, guidelines on it, so to speak in all these different languages. And the number one guideline is that they want to, whoever did it wants to keep the population on earth under 500 million people. And, and nobody has ever taken these down and they're protected. And one of the big things that happened this year was that a cube was put up there on the top of the one that's in English. And the cube had a cipher in it that described that these guys who built it, which I do believe is the cabal, intended to achieve their goals in 2014. And the cube, we can discuss how this is deciphered, but the cube gave us two dates. One date was the day that the government shut down in 2013, yep. the exact day that it shut down. And the second date was the exact day that the Ferguson riots got their most violent. And so when you see that that cube was dated 2014, it seems clear that they were hoping to create large-scale riots and a government shutdown. And that was the symbolism of the cube. And yet, we're now all the way through 2014. There's only a week left, and those goals did not happen. Who stopped it? Ultimately, we're dealing with a spiritual battle, and if you only look at it in terms of who's here on Earth, you're not going to really get what's happening. There are ETs all over the place. There's a whole lot of interest in our planet right now. There's all kinds of new people out there that are not usually the people that hang out in our solar system. There's a whole lot of very, very interesting stuff going on if you have contact with the type of insiders that I do, which unfortunately, very, very few people are in contact with these guys. So I'm one of the only people that can actually leak this kind of information to the public. With um, When it comes to the confrontations that were going down, we were right on the brink there with Russia for a minute with uh, Crimea. And certainly we're, we're dealing with ISIS too, which could spiral out of control at any second. We're also dealing with North Korea. But with, with Russia, that was a pretty scary thing. Went right up to the brink. Who is dealing with Putin and Obama to chill out that situation before it did spiral out of control because it, it was right there. Well, again, I have to speak in terms of what I really know, and I'm not going to dumb it down for you because that's disrespectful based on what I do know. Right. 
Uh, so you got to understand that this is essentially a proxy war that we're seeing on Earth. And what a proxy war means is like, for example, the Korean War was really U.S. versus USSR. But the USSR had, you know, was supporting the Koreans and then America was supporting the other side. So Afghanistan was another example. The Afghanistan war was essentially a U.S. versus USSR proxy war. So what we're seeing on Earth is a pro like between the U.S. and Russia is ultimately a proxy war between factions of extraterrestrial groups that are providing intel and uh, actual strategy and even intervention and battle uh, actions. Uh, so it's, it's rather complicated to explain, but there's all kinds of stuff going on behind the scenes right now that if the average person knew about it, it would completely be the, the uh, taking the red pill approach. You know? What can we do as a, as a civilization, both positive and negative? What well, can this, we do? Yeah, this is a really, that is the question, okay? Because a lot of people do talk about this uh, secret space program and the spiritual aspect. And you have to remember that the universe is not built to be staggeringly complex. The answers are simple. And the good guys ultimately are working off of a cosmic free will principle. And that means that what really matters is how we choose to think and act towards others. And that allows the positive guys to be able to do more when we act more positively. So, for example, this is why when you look at the meditation effect, you can have 7,000 people meditating together and the amount of crime and terrorism worldwide will decrease by 72%. So these group, this group of 7,000 people under one roof somewhere in the world, doesn't matter where they are, if they're in the right state of consciousness, they have this severely disproportionate effect on the amount of hostilities and fatalities in the world. And by the way, this has been scientifically proven in over 39 different documented studies, so that it, it's indisputable. All other variables were ruled out. Our consciousness is so much more powerful than we realize, and the bad guys are constantly, constantly trying to use that against us by such things as predictive programming where they put out in a movie like the latest uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes movie. The whole movie, if you watch that film, the very first scene in the film is a global apocalypse caused by some sort of Ebola type of virus. Mm -hmm. You take it for granted as soon as you watch this movie within the first two minutes that almost everybody died of Ebola. And that's and then the whole movie has scenes where you see these FEMA zones where everybody was quarantined before they all died, and now the FEMA zones are all overgrown by trees and vines and stuff. But they show you this throughout the whole movie. They show you houses that have X's on the windows because the people in there were dead, but it's all long gone now. So what they're doing when they put stuff like that out there is they're predictive programming. They want you to load that hologram in your mind and believe that this is what's going to happen so that they can then fire emotional energy into it when they create false flag events. And the false flag events create trauma, which make people think about the things they saw like in those movies. And then when we start putting our creative power into those thoughts and believe them, that allows the negative to accomplish more of these goals. So it's very important for us to focus on positive outcomes and really emphasize what we can do to create harmony in our own lives and for others. Because as I said with the meditation effect, that has a very strong effect on people's free will and on how things turn out on Earth. And I do believe that's why we haven't seen any major wars or massive fatalities this year. I, I agree with you on that. And I'll tell you something else that's interesting, and I'd, uh, I'd like your uh, answer on this. We have so many films that always show the 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 apocalypse the end whether it's a zombie Science. or an et movie. yeah it, it, it's all about that how come we or maybe we should <laughs> maybe we should uh <laughs> why don't we make a movie that uh that shows how we're being fed the 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 li the lifelike hologram of the apocalypse that is being fed why don't we why isn't there a movie the one singular movie that comes out that that 
that lays it out in that respect. What? Well, you, Amy Amy Berg tried to release a movie that was documenting pedophilia in Hollywood, and she got one premiere showing in New York, and we haven't seen or heard anything more about that movie ever since. Have you so seen? You got to be very careful about the term "we" here, because "we." implies that it's a democratic process where anybody can get a film financed and made. It right. doesn't look that way. That's And that's my point. Yep. That's exactly my point. <laughs> that's exactly my point. Why can't that film get made? It certainly seems... Even if you look at something like Pacific Rim or Transformers, it's all yeah. the same thing. You know, it's always the, the end of everything. It's the end. It's the end. Uh, well, and I remember somebody talking about Tom Cruise being interviewed for his movie Edge of Tomorrow, which I actually really liked. But it's such a taken for granted that he's in an interview and he goes, okay, so the premise of the film is aliens are invading the Earth. And it's like he just zooms right through that. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, aliens are invading. Boom. Let's go on from there. You know? <laughs> if you looked at the number of alien invasion films versus positive extraterrestrial films, I don't know. unbelievable. I, I don't know of one. I don't know of a positive one. Well, there, there's one recently that came out. It's a low-budget indie flick called Earth to Echo. It's pretty good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's really yeah. not very many. Right, right, right. Um, well, I guess, uh, what was the one with Keanu Reeves, the remake? Oh, uh, the Day the Earth Stood Still. Yeah, Day the Earth Stood Still. So I guess that kind of, you know, I, I, I guess. Well, even that of. film had some very upsetting and disturbing images in it, you know? Yeah, you know, and, and, and back to the point that we were making earlier, uh, all of the events uh, over the last, uh, all the big seminal events, whether it was the kickoff of World War I, uh, World War II, and the events that led up to that, the Korean War, Gulf of Tonkin, uh, uh, Cuba, uh, the going into uh, Iraq the first, the second time, uh, Syria, everything seems to have some kind of crazy false flag type of event tied into it and it goes all the way into Crimea and now what we're dealing with with North Korea is each one of these just uh, uh, a situation where we're pawns in chess you know and there's a big chess board out there and the game is being played right in front of us that statement would imply that we don't have any power to affect the outcome and I wouldn't say that we're disempowered I would say that this is historically how the game has been played. And I would say that the only way we have to stop it is by spreading awareness. And as people like your listeners are getting educated about this, it's becoming common knowledge. Uh, a female friend of mine had a mother who's very conservative, very much locked in the traditional matrix mentality. And about a half a year ago, she goes, do you think that the Bush administration was behind 9-11? Yeah. <laughs> oh man really yeah uh, i mean they even asserted that in the iron man 3 movie which was the top movie of 2013 in iron man 3 there is a bin laden type villain called the mandarin who at the end of the film turns out to be hired by guess who the vice president of the united <laughs> states of america and the guy playing the president of the United States is probably the closest looking actor they could have possibly found at George W. Yes, yes, yes. Unbelievable. Check this out. This uh, question just came in uh, via email. And it's, uh, it says, Jimmy, a while back I saw a YouTube video where David Wilcock was talking about the fall of the Illuminati. Literally tons of uh, gold bullion hidden underwater and a plan to arrest heads of state, top bankers, and their cronies. Haven't heard an update on that. Can you please ask him? Please, please, please. Sure. Um, <laughs> so there you go. Please, David, please. <laughs> All right. This is a very complicated subject, and I'm happy to give information within a certain range of tolerance. Uh, part of the problem is actually people like me, and I have to apologize to humanity right up front in saying that in some cases, Internet journalists such as myself in our zeal to try to get too specific, information unbeknownst to me was too precise and got people killed in commanding positions that were trying to get this mass arrest to happen. So sometimes in the past, we have naively given away too much and entire command structures that were trying to pull this off have gotten uh, fragged and, and killed. 
Uh, so this is a very, very serious war. It's very real. But there are some things I can say that are not going to get anybody killed. And one of them is, okay, number one, this is going to happen. And once it does, people are going to be listening to this show by the millions and other shows like this where I talk about it. So I want to make a, one point extremely clear. I am not involved in this. Nobody is asking me what to do. I have no commanding role. I have no decision-making authority whatsoever. All I'm doing is getting leaks from other people who are making the decisions themselves. I do not have control over what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, when they're going to do it, where they're going to do it, nothing. Okay? Okay. What I do know, I can tell you this. There are multiple groups all over the world who have had to sort out their differences and come to a common consensus about what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. That consensus has been reached. It's been reached for about two months. Mm. However, prior to that point, there was a great deal of disagreement about how they were actually going to pull this off because you're ultimately dealing with uprooting a structure that can use murderous force and very powerful international media propaganda to promote its agenda. So it's extremely lethal to try to go up against this cabal hmm. and very, very dangerous. Uh, so during the time that this international alliance, which includes a major faction from the East, a major faction from Russia, a major faction from Europe, lesser factions from uh, South America, lesser factions from the Middle East, from Arab countries, all different groups, including splinter factions in terms of groups that were in alignment with Bush that broke away, groups that were in alignment with the Rothschilds and broke away, groups that were in alignment with the Vatican and broke away. There are all these players involved. They all have different wants and needs, and they all had to come to a consensus. Now, some of the groups wanted there to be complete amnesty and wanted there to not be any fatalities as this process takes place. That decision has been vetoed there are going to be spontaneous assassinations that take place. So there is going to be some violence when this starts to happen. It's going to freak people out. It's going to be very controversial. I may have to garrison myself in my house for a while once this happens, but I'm telling you part of the reason why we're leaking this before it happens is so that when it starts to happen, the propaganda matrix is not going to be able to make this look like a coup and it's not going to be able to make it look like it's some sort of Russian Intel operation where they're trying to destroy America. That's not what this is going to be. It's going to be a very positive change because if you're worried about a coup over the United States government, guess what? It already happened and it was called hanging chads in the 2000 presidential election. Mm -hmm. If you're millennial and you were too young and you're fiddling around with the computer and not paying attention, go back and look at what happened in 2000. Mm -hmm. That's when the coup happened. That's what we've got to reverse now. When you talk about assassinations, are you talking about heads of state or bankers? Yeah, they, well, I don't look. I don't think Obama's going to get shot. He'll probably be brought into a tribunal, and he's going to end up crying and you know testifying of all the stuff that happened and the stuff that they made him do. Hmm. And there's probably going to be most of the heads of state will probably be fine. Uh, if you watch the movie Captain America: Winter Soldier, that film is a documentary. They're telling you exactly what they're going to do. And what happens at the end is there is a the, the basic premise of the film is that the group shield that we saw in the Avengers is actually essentially the NSA and other groups like that, CIA, etc. Uh, I can tell you that there has been a coup within the CIA. The CIA is now 60 percent in control of the alliance. What that means is that the CIA is now working for the good of humanity and Americans, and for patriotic Americans. So they're not, the CIA has had a total overhaul. One of the groups that is still in control of the cabal is Homeland Security. So there is a major battle going on between CIA and Homeland Security, among other groups. This is exemplified in the Winter Soldier film. And one of the things that you see in there is that a Nazi group called Hydra took over the American intelligence apparatus after the Nazis were brought here after World War II in something called Project Paperclip. They talk about this in the movie. And this was the second biggest movie of this year, other than I think Hunger Games then exceeded it. But the movie is telling you what they're going to do. 
and the leader of Hydra is shot to death at the end of the movie. So they're telling you that there are going to be probably a certain number of targeted assassinations. Now, again, nobody's asking me how to handle this, but it would also be extremely presumptuous for me to assume that I could understand what the tactical significance of those assassinations are or why that would be necessary. I'm not in any type of role to really understand what they're facing or what's going on. I personally would not vote for anybody to be assassinated. The, the more bloodless they can do this, if they could do it in a peaceful way, that would be ideal. And maybe there will still be some sort of divine intervention where events will take place in a certain way where it doesn't have to be bloody. I certainly hope that's what's going to happen. But we could actually see two or three weeks here in America where you're going to have exactly the same type of crazy headlines that were going on during the Boston bombing. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. if you remember watching the internet on the Boston bombing, I mean, I was on the edge of my seat and every, every big news website, it was all big, bold red letters, you know? So there's going to be a lot of that for a while. Is it, uh, <clears throat> when you talk about, well, I have two questions. One, when you talk yeah. about the, the, uh, you know, all of the gold being under the water, is that, in a literal sense, or are you... Uh, okay, that, that is true. I kind of blew off that part of this question. I apologize for No, that. that's okay. That's okay. That, that other information was very important to get out in some sort of public form like this, where it can't be redacted or changed. Right. Uh, so, anyway, as far as the gold goes, this is a vast subject. I did write an entire book on it. It's had a million and a half unique views. It's called Financial Tyranny. You can find it on my website, divinecosmos.com. And the Russians picked up my book and turned it into two three-hour primetime television documentaries that were on REN TV, which is one of their top networks. And the viewership was estimated 24 million people. Wow. And my face was in the documentary all over the place. And we have versions of that on my website that you can watch with English subtitles. Okay. So that being said, here's the story. The cabal has been planning to try to dominate the planet for many, many hundreds of years. If you really want to understand what the cabal is, it goes all the way back to Babylonian money magic and the idea of using a financial system to create a disparity between rich and poor so that a small group of isolated power elites can control who lives and who dies, who eats and who starves. They've been playing this game by becoming the people who are in power, never through actually being the elected leaders themselves. They almost never do that. Those are never more than mid-level people. The top people are not elected. The top people are the ones that run the money system. Mm -hmm. And that is not anti-Semitic. This has nothing to do with the Jews. And that's one of the things people start saying is, oh, he's anti-Semitic. He says it's the, the bankers, okay? When I say bankers, I'm saying every race, every religion has nothing to do with anything Jewish. Okay. Okay, that's very important. Now, there may be some Jews who are bankers. Yes, there's also Arabs. There's also Buddhists and Hindus and everybody you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So um, the real issue that's going on here is they, the cabal, is essentially a Roman Empire that transplanted itself to Great Britain beginning around 100 AD, took about 100 years, they migrated there. There's still a city in, in England called Bath that has the original Roman baths from 100 to 200 AD. You can still go in them now. Okay, so they, why did they pick Britain? Because it's the only large island that they could use as a base of operations to try to take over Europe, which at the time was the only really civilized area of the planet worth conquering. So this has been an ongoing battle. There have been different factions. There was a major battle at certain points between England and Spain. Uh, Spain actually at one point had taken over the Vatican. And there has been now a business agreement made, or there was, between essentially the financial cabal, which was centered in Britain, the religious cabal, which was centered in the Vatican, and then the military wing, which was centered in the United States, and it's interesting that there's only three city-states within nations in the world. There's the city of London in England, which is the financial center of the cabal. There's Vatican City in Italy, which is the spiritual center of the cabal. And then there's Washington, D.C., 
which is the military center of the cabal. Interesting. So what's happened is that this group got together and created the most incredibly vast systematic plan to plunder the world's wealth that's ever been contrived, and that was World War I and World War II. And what they did is they used these invasions of countries as a cover. The war was bloody. Yes, that's true. Everybody talks about how Prescott Bush, George Bush Sr.'s father, was Hitler's banker. What you may not realize is that Prescott's father, Samuel Bush, was the owner of the Remington Gun Company, which sold over 90% plus percent of all the guns to both sides of World War I. And think about that. So you can make money on selling the weapons, but that wasn't the main issue. The main issue was create these wars, and the real thing is that when you get into the country as a military invasion, invade their central bank and take their gold. And what happened is very secretly throughout the early 20th century, and especially in the 1930s, and a lot of it was done by Japan, which at the time was totally fascist and working with the Nazis. Remember, Japan was part of the Axis. They bombed us in Pearl Harbor. Right. Okay. They went through all of Southeast Asia and China and robbed everybody's gold. Nobody ever did it on such an industrial scale as Japan. They did horrible atrocities, including something called the Rape of Nanking in China, which is one of the greatest mass atrocities in human history. That's right. Okay. So what happened is they took everybody's gold. They hid it away in bunkers, which were originally supposed to be transplanted to the U.S., but then the patriotic American military that didn't know about this actually cut their supply lines with submarines and prevented them from being able to ship the gold over here. So the only step left they could do is to bury it in bunkers throughout Southeast Asia, of which there's well over 100. And these bunkers have a vastly higher amount of gold stored in them than what is officially on the books. The official amount of gold on the books is about one Olympic swimming pool size. It's 130 million met or 130,000 metric tons. Okay. The actual amount is supposedly about 14.5 times greater than that. Whoa, whoa. It's and it's never, it's never been found. That gold is, is not an ounce of it has surfaced. No, that's not true. That's not true. Okay. Um, it, it has. And uh, what... Uh, like, okay, I have one insider who worked for Reagan. In fact, Reagan's code name for him was Mr. Do. Well, I guess what I'm saying, uh, official, and, o officially, oh, yeah. not one ounce has ever been found. Let's let's uh, make that clear. Well, but, I mean, it's all documented. There are people who've written about this before. There are books before Financial Tyranny that I draw from that talk about this, and, and it's all actually quite well documented. Um, and I have insiders who have been inside these bunkers, and the insider who, as I said, was called Mr. Do by Ronald Reagan uh, because he was the, the inventor guy. He invented anything they needed uh, that was classified, um, solved all kinds of engineering problems. He walked in one of these bunkers. And imagine now you're going down a hall that's a mile and a half long. And as you walk down the hall, there are doorways on either side every maybe 100 feet. And each time you look into one of these doorways, what you're seeing – is a room that is the size of a basketball court piled to the ceiling with gold bullion bars. And you walk down that hallway for a mile and a half, and every room that you see is packed to the ceiling with gold. That's what happened. That's what's going on. So much of this gold was held in private collections because one of the big secrets is gold is actually not scarce. However, it turns out, that the place where gold is most plentiful is a vein that runs through Cambodia and Laos, Southeast Asia. There are, there, is a, there are gold mines that are so huge that you could literally just drive a bulldozer in there and bulldoze out gold boulders. Okay. Oh, man. And that hasn't been told to us. And that same vein actually ultimately runs down into Australia, and that's been kept secret as well. Plus, in the space program, there are asteroids they could go out and mine that are absolutely solid gold. So we do not have a gold scarcity. Uh, the gold, a lot of that gold that I said you could bulldoze out boulders worth of it, a lot of that has been mined, smelted, refined, and turned into, uh, you know, actual gold bars. And it was held in some very vast private collections 
And the main group that was doing this is called the Dragon Family. And it is actually ultimately a group of humans that immigrated here and were not natively born on Earth. And one of the oddities about this group is that they have their gene genome is such that they have a lifespan of between two to three hundred years for an average person. I and they are they are Asians. They are Asian looking, and they are living in exile. They're they're very secretive, uh, and there's a whole lot of story we could talk about with them when they got here. They formed China. They're the Qing Dynasty, the original Dragon Emperors. They built about 135 pyramids in the Qing Province of China, and the pyramids are still there. And interestingly, the pyramids still have a piping system that allows water to be piped into the tops of each of these pyramids. And what they would do is park their ships, which were called fiery metallic dragons. They weren't really dragons, obviously. Mm -hmm. They park the ships on top of these pyramids. And it's like a trailer park. You hook up the water hitch and you can just, you know, live in your ship for years at a time. Now, they do still have some of their ships here and they do also have a portal technology. And you can't go through the portal unless you're invited. But there have been uh, ongoing portal contacts with the rest of the dragon family people that are not on Earth. Um, and I probably shouldn't even have said that, but I guess I just did. So. Well, it, the, I, I think uh, one of the misconceptions, uh, including with myself, is uh, you know, all of the ET contact and agreements and everything are exclusively here to the United States, and they, they oh, are no. not, are, are they? No, no, no. Okay, ETs, bottom line, most of them, well, not all of them, but a lot of them are human. We have been severely, severely misled. We hear words all the time like aliens and creatures, and we take it for granted that we're dealing with something fundamentally inhuman. Nothing could be further than the truth. What we're actually dealing with is that the universe itself is sentient, the galaxy is programmed to create biological life, and that biological life will be hominid in our galaxy. It will have a head, it will have eyes, nose, mouth. There's very few that don't. It will have two arms, two legs, you know, opposable thumbs, all that kind of stuff. Um, I do have one insider who has personally handled over 2,000 different types of extraterrestrial bodies. And his job was basically just to autopsy them and try to identify organ systems. So I have a lot of different descriptions of what different types of ETs look like. And I can tell you that probably the most divergent one that he ever saw was kind of like a jellyfish hominid. And it basically had no real discernible facial features. Uh, it, it, the body looked like clear gel, except for a spot in the head and a spot in the middle of the chest. And when he autopsied it, he wasn't able to identify anything resembling an organ system. It was all just gel. Hmm. Uh, but most of the beings that are out there are human-like or actually human-looking. And in fact, we have been visited by multiple human groups, and they all have tinkered with our DNA. We are like a genetics wonderland. Our DNA is, has been spliced and re-spliced and tinkered with so many different races. There's actually 40 different extraterrestrial groups, most of whom are human or human-like, and some of which look just like people on Earth. There's one group that looks exactly like the Maoris from New Zealand, for example. There's, other, there's a couple other groups that look just like Asians on Earth. I, I now have found out there is a group that looks like black people. They look like uh, the Zulu tribe, actually, that, that type of a physique, except that they're really tall and really skinny. Um, so all the different types of people that are on Earth have extraterrestrial families. All the different races that we have here on Earth have extraterrestrial families. And on a secret level, they all these different groups, there's about 40 of them all together, have all presented to us, and meaning our secret government, genetic evidence, physical evidence, holographic evidence on these little iPads that they have that they show us movies on, that they are the guys that made us. How do we and tell? They how, can't all be right. Yeah. How how do we know when uh, one is standing next to us? Are we able to tell the difference? Is there something that sticks out? 
in some cases, it would be absolutely impossible not to know that you're in front of something very, very unusual. Some of these people, that there are micro ETs that are literally no bigger than about a centimeter to an inch in height. There are some, in fact, my guy that handled 2,000, the largest one that he ever saw was about 45 feet tall and looked like it was made out of rocks. Um, but the average uh, groups that we see were actually a little bit taller than average. The, the overall average, if you really wanted to standardize it, of height is about waist high for us or maybe a little bit taller. There are obviously other groups that are taller than us, some of which are significantly taller. There's a, a range of like 12 to 13 feet is fairly common. There's a range of about 8 to 9 feet is fairly common. But we're actually among the taller groups. Um, now, most of them do look predominantly human, but you're going to have some discrepancies. You're going to have, for example, all different types of skin color. And by that, I mean every type of color in the rainbow spectrum, if you then take it and turn it into a pastel. So you have people with pastel blue skin, pastel pink, pastel yellow, pastel green, pastel orange. Uh, so that's very common. A lot of them do have eyes that look larger than ours, so that would be one giveaway. Right. Uh, a lot of them are hairless, but actually a lot of them do have hair. It is common for them to have a larger head than we do as they get more advanced. Um, the elongated skull is fairly common. Uh, the gray type is actually not that common, and those are typically uh, more along the lines of an android, like a, a genetically grown drone. It's like a, they call them programmable life forms. So grays, that type, does not usually evolve naturally. They're, they're genetic uh, experiments, basically. They, they don't have a soul or a conscience? They're just a machine? It's sort of like an advanced biological robot, yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, they can right. be programmed to perform certain tasks. I mean, they are sentient, but they're not, they would not have uh, a typical type of soul evolution like we would think of. Let me ask you this. When we're talking about uh, this, the, the war that's going on and, and we're the tools, so to speak, is it some? It, it, can you equate it to? Is there uh, a, a good race of ET that is maybe controlling a country like the United States, and they're pitting us against uh, a China, so to speak? Or is it more inside, where the infighting is uh, on both sides of the Obama administration, pulling back and forth? You know, is it? There are. Yeah, there are. It's a very good question. Um, there are multiple ET groups, and it's not like the Lone Ranger where, okay, he wears the white mask, he's the good guy, and the other guy wears the black costume, and he's the bad guy. Okay. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> I mean, basically what we're dealing with is different groups with different agendas, some of which are more positive than others, and there are also positive beings that are multidimensional that largely stay out of the way and most of these ETs that I've been talking to you about and describing are not even aware that these higher dimensional beings exist. The higher dimensional beings are working sort of in a, in a very interesting veiled fashion that is not obvious to most of the ET groups that would look human. Right. But within the ET groups that look human, they have competing agendas, competing needs. And even within these societies, of course, you're going to have certain people who are divergent characters, so you'll have, like, your criminals, and you'll have your murderers, and you'll have your crooks who are going to go and try to steal something. So you can't just say that, like, oh, well, these are the, the blue aliens, and the blue aliens are the good guys, and the red aliens are the bad guys. It doesn't work like that. It's a very vast, complex sociological problem to solve. But what I can say is that there are alliances with different factions of ETs working with different factions on Earth, and the good guys are winning now by a significant degree, and it is building up to something that's going to be like a political, geopolitical, worldwide moment of truth. And we're probably not going to get disclosure immediately when this happens, but it probably won't take very long once it does. And let me ask you this. Are there any heads of state that are actual... ETs and and not uh, not human. 
For instance, Dick Cheney, E.T. <laughs> or human. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay, well. I, and I'm being serious. <laughs> don't laugh. Don't laugh. You know, uh, you know, uh, you know. I can look yes, at Obama. Okay. I can look at Obama and say alien pretty, pretty much, pretty freely. But well, I w again, I would use the term extraterrestrial because alien is like the N word. Once you talk to these people, they don't like that word at all. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I can see because that. Because they're Let's, families, right? Yeah, they yeah, their yeah. Mothers Let's, and children. Sure. You know, yeah, perfectly yeah. Perfectly good people if you talk to them. Right. Right. So Dick Cheney. E.T. <laughs> you know, are, are, is is there any uh, you know string pullers that are actual uh, E.T.s? Well, if I were to answer that question to the fullest extent of my knowledge, and then this all became public and disclosure, that could actually come back to haunt me and bite me in the ass. Well, but you I not answering is going to do. Say, okay, I will say truthfully. <laughs> As far as I know, no visible elected leaders who are heads of state are extraterrestrial humans. That being said, my knowledge is there's about 10 to 18,000 of them on Earth at any one time. And I do have some information that suggests that some people who work in the governments are, in fact, extraterrestrial humans. But they are not reptilians and they are not shapeshifters. Nobody's biology can do that. The only type of shapeshifter that exists that I've ever been aware of from all the different people I've spoken to is AI. There are certain types of AI that are based on nanites, which are tiny little robots that can assemble in any shape they want. The United States did have a huge problem with the nanites, which they solved in the 1970s. There was a time where nanite humanoids were actually going into the White House and were pooling down into carpets and things like that. And they put some very advanced technology inside the White House that basically prevents the nanites from being able to do their little uh, mechanical, electromechanical handshake that allows them to build into structures. It's essentially like a force field that keeps them from being able to get in. And so we've predominantly dealt with the AI problem. Most of the AI, in fact, as far as I know, all the AI has been essentially shooed away from the earth for now. So there is no such thing as a biological shape-shifting organism. And that is a, unfortunately, a very grotesque distortion of truth that's been promulgated by many people out there who really don't know anything. And I'm not saying that they are bad people. They just got bad information. Have you ever picked up the phone and talked to David Icke about this directly? You had to mention the thing. <laughs> I had, had to, to go, go there. there. I had to, I had to go there. <laughs> You know, I think David Icke is a hero. I think he's done amazing work. I, I, mean, I do, he, too. I absolutely. He has, he has said some disparaging stuff about me online, but this field, as you know, Jimmy, is similar to rap music, and everybody's wanting to bust a rhyme about how they're the, the greatest, you know? Well, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, I hear you there. I, I, I respect David Icke. He's been not only oh, yeah. a guest on this program, but uh, I think the, the one thing about him is uh, – that I think people uh, misconstrue a little bit is he speaks loudly and with conviction and that gets confused with uh, him being a bad guy. He's actually, he's, he's got a great soul and, yeah. and, and he believes in his message and he's very passionate about it. What a marvelous guided course, right? Where he, first of all, starts out as a major sports hero. In yep. Oh yeah. The UK. Then he becomes a major uh, newscaster, broadcaster, and center, you know, yep. And then he gets awakened to the truth and starts to disclose very real information. So he, he has been an indispensable part of our collective awakening. No doubt. Uh, and you know, I just wish that he was a little more focused on seeing people as all children of one infinite creator and not trying to paint people as uh, shape-shifting subhumans. Have you ever seen the, I'm sure you have, you've seen the video of one of uh, Obama's uh, Secret Service guys doing the shape-shifting? Have you seen yeah, that video? Yeah, that's a hoax. That's a hoax. It's a great yeah. video, though, man. You have to understand that there are, that <laughs> there's a lot of people who make money off of doing this stuff, and they're probably paid better than any of us are. Mm-hmm. So if, if I even got like a 10% credit 
of the amount of jobs that I've created just myself, I'd be far, <laughs> far better off than I am. You can get another Martin D45. <laughs> that that was between you and I. Uh, nobody else got it, but uh, you okay. get it. Uh, here, uh, th this uh, question is uh, from Renee, uh, one of our producers here. She says, "Have the larger number of good ETs overpowered the smaller number of negative ones?" And I guess I'm going to follow up with that question. What is the number? What is the ratio? The ratio of good ETs to bad ETs is significantly in favor of good ETs. One conservative estimate, and this is just the group that is the groups that are immediately politically involved with us in our local area, is six bad groups versus about 50 positive groups. So the negative groups are a lot less. Now, uh, when you're dealing with negative groups, interestingly enough, some of these negative groups also are the most physiologically divergent from us in terms of how they look. And that might be part of why they can dehumanize us because you do have uh, mantis looking people that essentially have legs and arms. They, their body looks hominid from the neck down, but then they have essentially an insect head with compound eyes and mandibles. Uh, so that would be a very, very disturbing being to see in front of you. Right. Uh, another type is there are actual reptilians and one of the types of reptilians does have a head that looks exactly like a Komodo dragon or the head of any of a number of reptiles like maybe an iguana. Right. Um, not quite like an iguana, but okay. If you go and you look at this uh, movie that was made by the guys, the movie trailer for the guy, the Wachowskis that did, uh, I can't really say guys anymore, right? But right. <laughs> the Wachowskis have this movie coming out in the spring called Jupiter Ascending. And if you watch the movie trailer, it's very edgy how much they're disclosing in that trailer. And one of the things you see in the trailer is a reptilian in which you take a reptile head and stick it on a hominid body. Now, there are people that look just like that, except that they don't have wings. The wings thing is, is a misperception. Then you also have reptoids, which have reptilian-like features, including scales and vertical slit pupils, but their heads would be more like what we would think of as a gray where it's a large head, large almond-shaped eyes, but with the vertical slit pupils, and they have more like a nose and mouth, whereas these other groups actually just have a snout and teeth, and they don't have any type of human-looking nose and mouth as we would normally think of it. Have you seen, with your insiders, with this type of information, have you seen photographs and, and, and such? There is one photograph that has leaked, uh, from a guy who was an Area 51 insider who recently died, and he leaked a picture of an orange. And this was a dead orange, and the oranges is a group that looks like greys, but they're actually very positive and very loving people. Um, that is an authentic photograph. And so if you go dig that reference up, and I, I'll try to find it for you. I have it in my notes. Okay. The problem is that the cabal is essentially in control of our space program, and there is a vastly lethal force that prevents people from pulling any type of data like photographs out. Even the level of difficulty that Snowden had in getting files out of the NSA on a thumb drive to try to get things out of the space program is basically impossible. Once you join the space program, if you ever get to come back to Earth at all, it's not for a 20 year period of time and they're gonna check every single inner and outer nook and crevice of your body before you ever get welcomed back into our society. And the people that are off, off planet, they do not have access to our internet. They do not have access to any news from the earth. They don't know anything about what's happening on earth. They are kept in the strictest secrecy and people from earth who interact with them are not allowed to tell them anything about anything that's going on. And there are millions of people that work off planet. They have been taken from the earth, a lot of them in the 1950s. They had a population boom. They've had a lot of children. There's a lot of cloning going on. There's a lot of these places off planet where you walk around and you see dozens and dozens of people with exactly the same face. Oh, interesting. So, interesting. Yeah. And what, what, about, uh, what about the moon? 
The moon is absolutely loaded with extraterrestrial encampments all on the dark side. Uh, the main base that we have on there is called LOC or Lunar Operations Center. And that is where people from our group and other groups actually rendezvous before they go elsewhere. Um, there were some very nasty ancient battles on the moon. Some of those debris fields are still left intact as a reminder of these various ET groups not to war with each other and why they shouldn't. But there are groups that have had battles with each other that could go on for 8,000 years. They've been hating each other and fighting with each other. And they may literally have encampments on the dark side of the moon that are only a couple kilometers apart from each other. And they keep very good borders. But, uh, you know, the, the moon, if you were to see the dark side of the moon, just with any type of typical telescope or anything like that, it literally looks like Manhattan at night. Is I've said that so much. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that if we have time. Is all of this to... I mean, what's what's the end game here? Is it to control the Earth and its resources, or is it just sport? You know, what what's the end game? Uh, well, with, you have with, to define which group's agenda you're referring to. Sure. Well, uh, well, if the ne they're negative groups, um, the negative groups again, it is, and I know it, it sounds very cliche, and I do apologize for this, but. Look, if you want to go back to the Bible, you got Jesus who's being tempted by the serpent in the garden. And as it turns out, and I've done this research for ancient aliens, I've done episodes for them. In fact, unfortunately, a lot of this stuff was left on the cutting room floor, which I don't think was an accident. There are reptilian groups that were on Earth in every major culture. The Indians, the Hindus called them the Nagas, and they are a serpent-looking people. Uh, there's actually Indian temples that have serpents all over them. You look over in Mesoamerica, and what do you have? You have step pyramids that have the plumed serpent on them, right? That's right. You have this Sumerian sculpture of a mother suckling an infant, and her head looks like a reptile head. This is not stuff that was done randomly. This is because these people were here. Garden of Eden? The Garden of Eden, same thing. So... It is a cliche, but it is true that there are negative ETs that look like what we would think of as demons. And it is also true that there are positive groups that have essentially come here. They are human. Jesus would be an extraterrestrial human. Buddha would be an extraterrestrial human. The second Buddha, which was Padmasambhava, who could fly and do all kinds of amazing stuff, he was an extraterrestrial. Very likely that uh, some of the South American gods, Quetzalcoatl was an extraterrestrial. And these people have been trying to give us the most basic spiritual teachings about just be nice. Is it really that hard? Just be nice. Because that's what's going to turn this thing around for us is all of the religions have seeds of the truth. Now, it's, it's really sad and unfortunate that the people in power, the people that are running our financial system and running the Western media, they are, in some senses, extremely blind to the greater positive nature of the universe and the spiritual reality that we live in. They have a spiritual philosophy, but it is rooted in a very controlling, manipulative, and negative mindset, which for them is the only truth. And they do not understand that they will be obstructed. They do not understand that they cannot win this. And they are very mocking and sarcastic about the Bible. They think it's a joke, that it's no better than toilet paper you wipe your butt with. When, in fact, the Bible and other great religious works are sort of like thumbnail sketches of what we're now going through. And the prophecies in the Bible and other works are essentially accurate. They're just very simplified for people from 2,000 years ago with the level of knowledge and vocabulary that they had available to them at that time. But the core essential nature of what the great religions teach us is the key of what all the benevolent ETs are still trying to do. They're still trying to get us these principles. They're still trying to make us uh, transform into a more loving society. And they work in a very strange reality where they're not allowed to directly intervene. They have to work on our free will. So 
They can only give us clues and trails of breadcrumbs. They can't just show up in the sky and show us religious icons for whatever culture is appropriate and say, here we are. We're the ones that you've been reading about for the last 2,000 years, and we're back. They can't do that. And which uh, leads me to this question. How long have they been here? And before you answer, here we have ob- the obvious things are, you know, Giza and, and Stonehenge and some of the other megalithic sites, but certainly Gobekli Tepe now, which which yeah. goes back an additional 10,000 years. Uh, have they been here at least that long, or are we talking hundreds of thousands of years? Oh, yeah, much, much, much older. Um, you have to understand this is all some new insider information I've gotten recently. We've had a, a wonderful breakthrough with some new people coming forward who know a tremendous amount, and I can explain how incredibly awesome it is to talk to somebody. I have thousands of things that I've not leaked online, for various reasons, and part of them is I need to be able to see who's real and who's just parroting things that I already leaked online before. Right. And there are people out there who are claiming to be insiders who are basically just compiling what they've heard from me and other people. So Mm -hmm. I hold a lot of things back so that I can see who's real. Right. But we've had some very, very real people show up that know a heck of a lot at the very highest level, and I've learned a lot more. And one of the things that I know now is that the top third of Africa, the Sahara Desert, Mm -hmm. was all a vast civilization, and we're guessing it was probably that way about 50,000 years ago, and it was all wiped out in a massive, massive attack. And the Giza Plateau in Egypt is only the highest portion of a civilization that is still very real and is all waiting for us under the sand anywhere between about 40 feet to 100 to 400 feet down of sand in the Sahara Desert. If we started just digging out the whole Sahara Desert, it would be the ultimate extraterrestrial artifact playground like you can't imagine. So many buildings, so many technological artifacts down there, it is totally mind-blowing. The same thing is true with Antarctica. There are gas pockets in Antarctica caused by volcanism that melts the ice, and if you go down there... There are huge areas of totally toppled over ruined buildings of vast size and also very significant underground bases below the surface of these areas as well. And actually the Nazis in World War II were the first ones to go to Antarctica and they went into some of these pockets and cavities and found some of these places and basically reoccupied it and took it over and that was the New Berlin base that they then transferred their operations to at the end of World War II when they realized they were losing before they went to the moon. At the same time, they also went to the moon because the Nazis were the first government to develop flying craft using anti-gravity, thanks to a few different things they got, one of which was Victor Schauberger's work, one of which was from extraterrestrials that had contacted the Nazis, like some of these reptilian groups. Uh, They made treaties with them. And, in fact, the original Lunar Operations Center on the moon is still there. It's, it's ruined now. They don't use it anymore, but it is a swastika-shaped building on the moon, believe it or not. With, um, uh, with Antarctica and the Sahara Desert, the northern part of Africa, is any of yeah. that still occupied, or has it just been abandoned? Underground facilities, very much so. Um, There are a lot of different ETs here that still work in and around our Earth. There are undersea bases, underground bases. And you got to understand that the Egyptian priesthood went around to various digs that they had conducted and found all kinds of ancient, very, very valuable extraterrestrial documents and books, actually. And some of these books have indestructible pages that are They look like paper, but they're not made out of paper. It's some sort of Kevlar type of material. Hmm. And uh, those books were stored in the Library of Alexandria. And then when they allegedly burned the Library of Alexandria, that was a false flag. And all they actually let burn was census documents and tax forms. And they took all the good stuff and relocated it to, guess what? The Vatican Library, where it still is today. And there is a vast repository of extraterrestrial books 
that goes back to the whole history of extraterrestrial colonization of our solar system, which includes Mars, which includes the moon, which includes a planet that was a super earth that blew up and became the asteroid belt. They had settlements all over the solar system. Most of the large moons in our solar system still have vast amounts of ancient bases dug into them. There's ancient toys all over the place in our solar system. They're everywhere. What about the Malibu Deep Underwater Base? I haven't had a chance to talk to you about that. We made the discovery back in May, and, uh, well, we didn't discover it. It was already there. You know, yep. We didn't plant a flag on anything, but we certainly brought it to the media. Um, and I haven't yep. had a chance to talk to you about that directly. Uh, what do you know about that? I know it's there. I know it's definitely real. I don't know actually that much about whether it is uh, manned by – Earth-based personnel or extraterrestrial or some combination of the two. But there are a fairly good number of extraterrestrials that work in underground and undersea facilities. When I mentioned before that there's about ten to 18,000 people walking around here, mm -hmm. uh, those people are not – I'm not including those in the, in the underground category. Those are just people that have some sort of immigration papers and have been allowed to be here. And they're not threatening. And they're very, very, very tightly monitored, by the way. So if people start freaking out about this stuff and they get all paranoid, look, these are ordinary flesh and blood beings. If you shot them with a gun, they're going to blow up just like anybody else. They right. don't have any special capabilities. They may have, you know, certain types of uh, weapons, but they're not allowed to bring those weapons here. So they really do not they're, – they're at a total disadvantage. There is no advantage to these people telling us who they are. And part of the plan for disclosure has been that if we get to that point, like, for example, it didn't happen, but there was a plan on the table that Obama was going to tell us in 2009, in November, that there were five different extraterrestrial human groups that have been working with the United States government for about a century – it's not, it didn't start with Roswell. It's a lot older than that. He was going to introduce us to these people on live television, two hour special that would have been on every network all over TV. And he was going to say, these people are here to help us. Please don't shoot them. And that would have been mind blowing. It didn't happen, but it could have happened. And it was thwarted by five different factions that made sure that he wasn't going to do that. And one of the ways they made sure he wasn't going to do that was the Norway spiral. Isn't it interesting that Obama was going to accept the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo, Norway, and the night before he does, this massive holographic spiral thing shows up in the sky right over where he's going to get the prize. And at the same time, you had a gigantic mile-wide floating black tetrahedron appear over the Kremlin in Russia. That's right. Those were our cabal people threatening Obama because – the, the original attempt that was going to be made on November 21st, 2009, that's when they booked the time. We actually had somebody working at a high level for one of the major uh, television networks who leaked this to us. Uh, again, I only hear about this stuff third hand. Nobody's talking to me directly. I hear about it from somebody who hears about it from somebody. But what happened is the plan was thwarted and there was a backup plan that Obama was going to make the announcement when he got the Nobel Prize. And the night before he gets the Nobel Prize, they generate the Norway spiral. And he was told by somebody who was compromised and was close to him in his security detachment, by the way, Mr. Obama, if you decide to say anything tomorrow, you wouldn't like it if Air Force One happened to fly through one of these, would you? Wow. Yeah, that's what that was. It was a massive, ballsy, masculine, incredibly aggressive threat don't you dare do disclosure when you get the Nobel Prize. And he didn't. So, uh, you know, okay, we have 10 minutes left. You know, maybe we can stretch it. It really flies by. Huh? Yeah, it does. Well, we, you and I knew that, though. Yeah. Um, uh, next time we'll, uh, we'll do four hours. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding either. Okay. okay. Uh, well, there's, we're scratching the surface on all of these subjects. You know, we're, we're doing our best here. But let me ask you this. Um, I've seen you, uh, you've been, you know, forced into walking around with, uh, security, uh, you know, that armed, armed secure, I mean, real security. 
That is correct. Uh, and uh, how is how is your private life? I mean, knowing that I've seen it myself with my own two eyes. I remember the last time that I saw you, you literally had to turn to your security guy to calm him down. <laughs> this guy's a friend of mine. It's cool. I'm like, man, wow, really? But but I've seen it. And so, you know, how is your private life? And, and how do you uh, – you want to share that with us? How do you deal with it on a day-to-day basis now? I essentially keep myself extremely isolated uh, because there are threats against me. I have to be extremely limited in how much uh, I leave my house. Uh, I do have various forms of security that I have in the house, um, including a dog that is a, one of the breeds that you want to have. Right. Um, and uh, Yeah, it's not a schnauzer. I, 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 do, I do not own any firearms. Uh, I, I have been guided not to do that. Uh, I wouldn't want them here because then they'd be used against me. And they'd, you know, I'd be fr- framed as like a anti-government radical or a terrorist or something like that. So I do not have any weapons here. Uh, but there are, there are also divine protections, which some people are going to laugh their ass off when I say this, but this is a spiritual war. And as I said, I think on your show last time, there is a law that says that the bad guys are not allowed to shoot the Red Cross workers. And that is an absolute reality. So yes, yes. as long as I don't do anything corrupt in a, in a spiritual, moral, ethical sense, I haven't ripped anybody off. I haven't banged any female fans that would love to bang me, and there's plenty of them. <laughs> uh, you know, believe me, dude. I mean, it's like you want to talk rock star. It's the same thing when it comes to this field. Sure. So, you know, especially go up on stage in front of two, 300 people, you get all kinds of crazy stuff that happens. Yep. Just in trying to get from the stage to the bathroom, you know, it's like you get 20, 30 people try to stop you. So my, my attitude is, uh, you know, there's not very many people out there who are doing what I'm doing. And then of those people, a lot of them have had various character defects, which some of them are honest about, some of them are not. And then those character defects at various times can end up leaking. And then those people are humiliated or discredited. And in some cases, they do it to themselves. So, for example, you're never going to hear me publicly saying something derogatory about other people in my field. Another example, I will never betray the confidence of any of my sources. I would rather take a bullet than betray someone's identity because that gets people killed and people have been killed. There has been a lot of ignorance and stupidity in how we've handled this, and I didn't even learn the full extent of it until recently. I don't think that I personally leaked any information that got people killed, but others who have been talking about this definitely did. Mm -hmm. So this is real, and it's a battle. And I I forget what you asked me. I'm sorry. Well, uh, you know, I mean, it's uh, you live a very sheltered life now. There used to be a time when you could run around the streets and do whatever you want, but it's not that kind of party anymore. And I'm in a garrison mentality right now. Sure, I, 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 I stay at home. And I have very limited social interactions, and pretty much the only people I talk to are insiders. So most of the people I talk to have highly advanced special ops military training. And as a result, I'm much more sympathetic to the military than I used to be. And if I had the opportunity to serve in a valiant military force, I would gladly do it. But there is nothing like that on Earth right now, unfortunately. Were you – was this – was this life an accident or do you feel like, or, or have you been told that you were chosen? Well, chosen implies a messianic Christ complex, which I have fastidiously tried to avoid, even though many people put their projections on us. In fact, this is a very interesting point. It's side of a side tangent, but it's worth saying the various extraterrestrials that have tinkered with our DNA for thousands of years programmed us for certain things. One of the things they programmed us with is that we have a huge bandwidth of emotions, much more than most other groups, which is our greatest weakness. And it also potentially makes us very threatening to them because when we harness the power of our emotions, we can make massive spiritual growth very quickly. Another thing that we've been genetically programmed to do 
is to create and worship idols. And that is a very essential stage of our awakening is to stop doing that and recognize our personal power rather than wanting to have a hero figure that we think is going to save us so that we can just sit pretty and not have to do anything ourselves. That's an interesting point. Do the E do the ET races, there's so many of them, but do they have a religion or do they uh, recognize uh, that they, they don't have hero worship? You know, how is, what's their, uh, what's their uh, uh, relationship with themselves and religion? Oh, I think I just lost David. I just lost my internet, just went down. No. No, 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 no.